Now we're going to really kick up the speed here. You guys thought it was confusing before. What we get to it now? Okay, we're going to talk about prevention programs. Um, basically, what we're going to start off with is kind of set the stage so that you guys know what the context of the next several presentations is going to be in relationship to dealing with an overall comprehensive aquatic invasive species management program, okay? The next three presentations, we're gonna talk about prevention, we're gonna talk about uh, monitoring, and we're gonna be talking about control and management, okay? These are all components of a overall program to manage aquatic invasive species. So we're gonna start, I'm gonna lay the groundwork with that. Then I'm gonna get down into it and start talking about prevention itself. Um, and the different components of prevention, uh, education and outreach, decontamination. We're gonna talk a little bit about hazard analysis, critical control point planning, uh, risk assessment planning, things of that nature, okay? These are all components of a uh, uh, prevention program. So with that, we'll dive into it. So we've been talking about aquatic invasive species, in particular, quagga mussels, okay? Uh, this is what we do. Uh, as an agency and as a program in the Pacific Southwest region. We cover the state of California and Nevada. And what we do is workshops like this where we basically teach and provide information to people so that they can develop a comprehensive aquatic invasive species management program for their water body or watershed, okay? And the components of a management program consist of risk assessment, prevention, monitoring and then what we call rapid response and then control and management. These are the basic components of a comprehensive program. So we'll take and go through each of these real quick and then we'll get into uh, dealing with the uh, prevention aspect of it in more detail. So risk assessment first. Okay, this is critical. When you're looking at setting up a program for a water body, it's important that you know what the risk is for an invasion of an aquatic invasive species, whether it's quagga mussels or milfoil or whatever. You need to look at it and you need to take and make a, a determination or a call of what the risk is that an invasion is going to happen and whether or not it's going to have significant impacts to your operation or the environmental conditions of the water body, okay? And the basic components of that, you need to identify potential invasive species. You need to evaluate the suitability of the water body or the watershed that you're dealing with. You need to look at potential vectors of introduction, okay? How can these things come in? How can they be introduced to the water body, okay? Then you need to evaluate for physical, physical uh, infrastructure and the vulnerabilities of for, to your operations <coughs> for what that would cause. And then you need to do a balancing act. You need to look at this trade-off. And we've been talking about, you know, some of the stuff here where we're looking at trading off how we're going to deal with these type of things. We need to make a call. Is it worth the cost of doing X to save Y? Or how do we go about doing that? So it's a balancing act. And this occurs at a level much higher than anybody in this room possesses. So anyway, so risk assessment, okay? This is a program that we have and we take and help agencies do this. Call it ISRAP, Invasive Species Risk Assessment and Planning. And as a federal agency, you know we love our acronyms. So this is a real juicy one. HACCP's another one. We'll talk about that one a little bit too. And prevention program. We're going to take and do a little more detail on this a little bit in a few more minutes, but these are basically the components of a prevention program. You're going to hear a lot about this throughout the course of the day. A lot of these components translate to other aspects of aquatic invasive species management, education and outreach, inspection certification programs, decontamination, hazard analysis, critical control point planning. These are all components of prevention program. We'll talk more detail on those in a minute. Monitoring program, we're going to talk a lot more about that in the next presentation, but basically this is basically uh, the purpose behind it. Uh, you're basically uh, identifying the present invasive species, uh, initiate eradication strategies become the, before they become well established, minimize the spread of invasive species to other water bodies, 
and early implementation of long-term management and control actions. That's the basis for uh, your, your management, or rather your monitoring program. Okay, another one, rapid response. Okay, this is the, in, the initial action taken once you realize you have an invasion that's occurring in your water body. The best chance you have for eradicating aquatic invasive species is immediately when it begins to become, a, when it's introduced into a water body. Once it begins to become established, it is practically impossible to eradicate an aquatic invasive species from a water body, okay? And basically this is accomplished through the development and implementation of a species or water specific rapid response plan, okay? These things have to be done in advance and ready to go on the ground as soon as you have a indication of an infestation. And then control and management, basically control and management. Control and management is basically a long-term process of controlling and managing, managing the infestation that you have in a water body. Keep it from moving to other water bodies, keep it at a level that it does not impact the environment or the operational viability of the facility, okay? And eradication, that's a complete removal of the invasive species from a water body and very rarely is successful. So, any questions on AIS comprehensive management plan? Okay, take a couple real quick. Well, since um, rapid response is a component here, are, are there examples where you guys have been able to rapidly respond? Because this doesn't seem like a rapid response to me. No, I mean, this is already, this, this is already ongoing. But sometimes you get it. Can't get it. Can you give us an example? Uh, there was a um, there was an initial infestation of Nerodia up near UC Davis in a small water pond in a park. Uh, where they found some of those, uh, went in there with USGS, trapped the, trapped the snakes out and got them out of there right away. Another one down here, uh, same situation, uh, water snakes uh, at uh, Machado Reservoir, went in and got those out right away. As soon as we found out that they were there, they went in and moved. Well, the reason I ask is because the waters have been in California for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's beyond the rapid response. There, nobody's done a, a rapid response on quagga mussels because uh, most often once those have been discovered, once we've, they have been found, it's already beyond that stage. It's, we're not finding them soon enough, which we'll probably talk, we'll talk about more about that in the monitoring phase. When we talk about monitoring, where you need to be, what you need to find out, when you need to know it in order to be successful in a rapid response. Ron, what specific authority does Fish and Wildlife have for reviewing or commenting on the uh, control and monitoring plan required by the department, Fish and Wildlife? Okay, we don't have any, we don't have, the federal doesn't have any uh, authority on dealing with that uh, as far as the state's concerned. That's state regulation, state uh, component and requirements, so we don't participate in that. Okay, one more. When you're talking about your risk assessment, and specifically for quagga mussels, and you speak about water bodies, do quaggas um, live and survive in rivers as well as in lakes, or are they really a, a lake species? They can survive in both. Uh, depends on the water body. Uh, you know, right now they're in the Colorado River, St. Croix River, Mississippi River. Uh, small streams uh, like uh, St. Clara River here, they may be able to survive in areas where there's enough water, slow water, temperatures and conditions are right. Areas where the water flows faster is not good habitat for them, not likely to find uh, infestations of them there. So slow water. Slow, you know, relatively moving water because they need food coming to them, mm -hmm. but usually small streams you generally don't see it. Okay. Ron, yeah. Just sure. So just in terms of rapid response, obviously that hasn't occurred yet. But those of you who are not dealing with this problem, you really want to think about this. And there's many steps you can take to allow you to do things more rapidly. Um, some of that is pointed out in the, the eradication. 
education and in health practice um, publication I told you guys about earlier, but it's really important to think through. I mentioned getting divers, knowing what you're going to do in terms of being able to get people in the water. That's one example. But there's several steps of evaluating your habitat, knowing what's out there, or you might want to you know, look to target areas. A lot of that can be done now, and especially you know, Mother Nature, yes, it's awful we're in a drought, but for quagga mussels, you can see a lot more. You can go look at other surfaces. You can actually map out the areas and understand better what your what your habitat is. So just to encourage thinking about doing that. Okay. All right. Okay. We'll move on. Okay. So prevention. Now we're going to get into a little more detail on prevention programs. Okay. Stopping aquatic hitchhikers. Okay. So. For those of you that didn't know, this is how poodles came to America. Black ones and white ones and gray ones, they all came the same way, same banana boat. Uh, so your elements of an AIS prevention program, okay, again, education and outreach. It's critical that you involve the public, okay, that's part of what we're doing here today. A lot of you people that are participating in this are aware of what's going on. You're also getting educated so that you know what you can do. It's important that the public and the users and the stakeholders are aware of what's at risk when you're dealing with aquatic invasive species, particularly things like quagga mussels, okay? Education and outreach. An inspection program, okay? The idea behind inspection programs is you're trying to intercept and break that, that chain where the vector is, okay? You're trying to take and keep from having infested boats move into an area, infect, infested equipment, those type of things, inspection program. It's, it's critical to keep quagga mussels out of a water body. If you don't have an inspection program in place, you're gonna have quaggas before too very long, okay? And then decontamination, okay? Lots of times people are moving boats from place to place. You need to have a program in place where you can decontaminate those boats before they leave your plate, your facility if you have quagga mussels and then go to someplace else, a neighboring reservoir or something like that. Decontamination is important. You need to have that as well. And then hazard analysis, critical control point planning. Okay, that's a process that we'll get into, but basically what it is, it's a planning process that looks at your activities and what you're doing and allows you to take and put a, something in place to keep from moving aquatic invasive species from one place to another. So, a little more detail on these and we'll, we'll go with them. Education and outreach, okay, this is a program that uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, this is what we do, okay, this type of workshop, this is what we do, okay. Uh, we have the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers program that's out there, it's available for you to use and take advantage of. We also have what's known as Habitatitude. This is a program for the pet industry where we basically get together with the pet industry. We keep in messages, don't dump your pets, okay? You get your pet goldfish, you don't want it anymore, you take it, let it go in Lake Pyro, now you got goldfish in Pyro along with the quagga mussels. So this is one of those type of programs that encourages pet owners to take and bring their pets back to the pet store and those, whoops, and those, uh, those uh, uh, retailers that participate in that. So that's what that's all about. 100th Meridian program, that's the one that you saw in the video. The idea behind that was to keep quagga and zebra mussels on the eastern side of the 100th Meridian. Well, they're now on the other side, but uh, the aspects of that program are still, are still in place. And right now, don't move a muscle. That's what you're, you're seeing portions of that here today. That's the program that we've set up with the state of California, and that's the one we use to keep and inform folks about the dangers of quagga mussels and moving them from place to place. Okay, inspection programs. Uh, basically, you have to have something in place where you're out there, you're looking at things that are coming into your water body, coming into your watershed, okay? Whether they're, they're recreational boats and watercraft, uh, dock and bulkhead materials, okay? We've got zebra mussels in San Houston Reservoir. They got in, brought in on maintenance equipment. Nobody will admit that, but that's how they got there. Uh, trash racks, head gates, if you're taking and moving these type of things from one watershed to another, you need to take and inspect those, make sure they're clean, make sure they're decontaminated. Uh, 
uh, maintenance equipment, buoys, anything that you're getting in the water, anything that's in the water for a long period of time where it can become encrusted with zebra mussels or quagga mussels or some other type of aquatic invasive species. When you're moving things from one place to the other, good practice, clean it, dry it, and then move it, okay? And boys, other navigational aids, these type of things move from place to place. This is just some example of, uh, of things that need to be inspected and what your inspection program can do, okay? Watercraft inspection. The video we showed earlier today has a watercraft inspection training video that's on that. Some of you, if you want to see that this afternoon, maybe we can spool it up if you'd like to see that. Uh, but that's available for folks to, uh, to check out and do. I've got some copies of the Don't Move a Muscle video in the back here. If you'd like to grab one of those, I uh, would be glad to set you up with those. It's a newer version. It's the 2011. I showed you the 2008. Uh, the 2011 is much longer and longer winded and has a lot more stuff into it. We go with the shorter one because it's rough enough as it is. So anyway, uh, decontamination. Okay, decontamination. Okay, you have an inspection program, you're doing inspections, you're finding things. Okay, when you find it, what do you do with it? Well, you got to clean it. You got to decontaminate it. Okay. There's a whole range of things we're looking at here with decontamination, okay? Uh, different methods for decontamination, okay? The number one is drying, okay? How effective is that going to be? Okay, drying things out, okay? If you're from the Bay Area like I am, drying things out doesn't work so great because it's foggy most of the time there and very damp. However, if you're living in Death Valley or maybe here in Lake Piru area or whatever, uh, drying may work just fine, okay? as far as decontamination. Uh, chemical, that's another one that a lot of people use. This is generally used on equipment that is used frequently and between different watersheds. Very effective for controlling things like um, New Zealand mud snail, those type of things, okay? Chemicals on larger pieces of equipment, watercraft, things like that, generally not as effective unless you're trying to decontaminate like a uh, a wake boat that has a ballast tank in it that you cannot completely dry. You need to decontaminate that. You need to put something in there that's going to kill any, any biologicals that are there. There's a whole range of different type of chemicals that can be used. Sparquat, bleach, uh, quaternary ammonia, vircon, you know, 409 degreaser vinegar works as well. Uh, there's a whole range of things. There's uh, information out there. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife website has that. If you want to take a look, they have proposed uh, solutions. They have uh, concentrations that work, and they have lists of the different species that you can control using this. I recommend you take in uh, and look at, look at that program. Here's an example of using uh, a chemical, using quaternary ammonia to clean waders when we're doing surveys or fishing, going from one watershed to another. Uh, basically, uh, you scrub off the materials. Uh, this is the, uh, the setup generally we take in the field when we go out. Basically, it's a bucket, uh, your decontaminant, clean water, and a scrub brush. Put your chemical onto your wader boot. Okay, make sure you get a good soak. Let it sit for the required length of time that it's needed to be effective on the species you're trying to target. Give it a good scrub again, and then just rinse it off. Okay, you want to make sure when you're rinsing it off, of course, it's not going into the stream up on the driveway parking lot. That works great, uh, but uh, you don't want to put these type of chemicals in the water in the stream. So, uh, you know, there's lots of things. And freezing works as well. You'll need a freezer that's probably not quite as iced up as this particular one, but nonetheless, also check with the wife too if you're going to throw your waders into the freezer before you do that. Uh, but if you have a large enough freezer, chest freezer or something like that, uh, you'd basically just take your waders or whatever equipment you want to decontaminate, put it into a large uh, garbage bag, stick it in there for 24 hours to freeze solid, and you're good to go unless you want to wear it first thing in the morning and then you need to thaw it out. But <laughs> anyway, uh, that works as well. So, uh, and then, you know, water. Just using plain water to decontaminate your equipment. Water pressure, wash the, wash the invasives off. Uh, water temperature, uh, you heat it up. Uh, do a pressure watch, rinsing, that type of thing works good. 
Uh, there's uh, the parameters and temperature stuff on the uh, uh, 100th Meridian website. Uh, they can look in, you can look and find out what the contact time is, what the water temperature needs to be to kill quagga mussels that are on boats or whatever. That information is there and available. Uh, this is a decontamination station out at Lake Mead. Basically what they do, they pull the boat up on there, they pressure clean it, wash it, and then inspect it, and then they're down the road. So this is uh, one way to go about dealing with that. So. With that, we'll talk a little bit about hazard analysis and critical control point planning. Just to shoot this one out here real quick. Okay, this is basically a tool that you can use to reduce the risk of moving aquatic invasive species from one water body to another, okay? It's useful for just about any activity you can think of, all righty? And it's pathway focused, okay? This is getting back to what we talked about earlier, how things move from one place to the other, pathways, vectors, these are the type of things that it focuses on to, to break that chain so you don't have things moving from one body, water body to the other, okay? Now, one of the things that a lot of people say is, okay, well, we've got decontamination procedures. That should work fine. Well, yeah, it does. Uh, you know, if everybody had uh, basic uh, BMPs and this was the standard way they took and did their field work or whatever, that would be great. But the problem is once you take and step outside your normal activity, okay, what if something breaks down, what if something changes, you're not following your standard protocol, your BMP no longer works, okay? So what you need is something that allows you to be flexible enough to still be effective in controlling aquatic invasive species, okay? So HACCP is the process that you can do that, okay? Uh, it's basically a step-by-step -step method, and it considers all pathways of your activity that can be used to introduce something in one place, okay? It targets your control actions for when it's most convenient and most effective at controlling your, the invasive species, okay? It allows you to look at what you're doing and make a call there. When is it most effective, okay? We've all, those of us that have worked on field crew, you know, at the end of a long day, you're not very interested in washing up gear and stuff. You're ready to go home and whatever. Uh, so it's important to have something that's convenient and easy to use so that field crew actually do it. Uh, it identifies methods to ensure prevention is successful. It's a process that not only do you go through the process of cleaning the equipment, but there's a check in place to know whether or not you're effective at doing it, okay? It has contingency plans if problems arise. If things don't go right, things change out of the normal, it allows you to be flexible and still be effective. And there's a documentation process in place that people can look, you get new people that come into your organization, you take and show them the information, they can read it, they can synthesize it, they can understand it, and then they can do it, okay? So it's important. Five, five quick steps, that's all it takes, okay? Basically identify the location, actions and activities you're gonna be involved in. You identify the potential risk of an introduction, whether it's gonna happen, whether it's not, or if it can happen at all. You identify the point in the given activity where the risk of the introduction can be reduced, where it's most effective. You identify and implement a control measure, whether it's freezing, chemical decontamination, hot water, drying, whatever it is you're gonna do, you identify what that is. And then you, eval you have a point where you identify and you evaluate the effectiveness of the control measure you implemented. That's HACCP, very straightforward. You can do any type of program with it, fast, easy, and don't let the acronym scare you. It's easier than the acronym, so there we go. So with that, any questions? Great, I slayed you guys all in one fell swoop. Okay, good, with that. Um, Clayton. <laughs> Clayton's going to come on and share. So, just uh, my name is Clayton Strain. I'm the Senior Park Services Officer at Lake Piru. Um, to give you a little bit of history about our prevention program at the lake, um, 
When the issue started to occur in California in the Colorado River system, late 2007, 2008, um, in this region, Casitas was really a front runner in starting the prevention program. And so with them kind of leading the way and getting chased with pitchforks, we followed sneakily behind. And uh, we implemented an inspection program at that point that said clean, drain, and dry. Didn't matter. All boats coming into the reservoir had to be clean, drain, and dry. Um, and for five and a half years, that worked well. We didn't have quagga mussels. We were annually inspecting low years of around 5,000, high years of as many as 11,000, you know, average of around 7,500 boats. Um, in 2010, as part of that process, we started doing substrate monitoring. Um, we had five or six substrates at various locations on the reservoir, and uh, they varied at depths and locations, and we monitored them irregularly several times a year. We'd go out, pull the substrates up, look for quagga mussels to see if we had anything, and up until the time we found quagga mussels, we had never seen anything with the exception of we found the freshwater limpet, thought that it could be a quagga mussel because we aren't biologists and we sent it off to the state and they said, no, you're okay. Um, the substrate that we discovered in 2013, that same substrate had been monitored uh, and inspected about five months prior and we didn't see any adult mussels. Five months later, we pulled it up and we found adult mussels on it. Um, as part of that inspection program, Every boat coming into the reservoir was offered the state flyer that you saw earlier, the red and black, don't move a muscle flyer, um, from day one. That was part of our education and outreach. Um, all of our staff went through WIT, uh, watercraft inspection and decontamination training uh, put on by Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission out at Lake Mead um, so that we could, in theory, be able to best identify what we were looking for and be able to inspect those watercrafts coming into the reservoir. Um, in addition to that, as the program evolved, um, one thing that's not on here, in 2011 we started doing what we call vessel inspection tags. Um, you've heard it called banding. Um, for repeat visitors that if they wanted to come back to the reservoir without having to go through the full inspection process, we would cable their boat to their trailer so that they could come back without going through that full program, the full inspection process. We just do a cursory search on the exterior of the boat to make sure there wasn't adult mussels. And what that did is that prevented them from launching their boat off of the trailer at another reservoir and made it identifiable when they went to another reservoir that they were cabled and locked to the trailer. Um, if they came back without an intact inspection tag, they would have to go through the inspection program again. If they failed an inspection as part of this inspection program, they were quarantined for a certain period of time, which was based on the 100th Meridian Initiative for dry time in our region. Um, we found that that was not really a consistent time frame. Somebody had to go on the computer every day, so we set it that it was 14 days in the summer months and 28 days in the winter months. Um, then in 2012, one of the concerns I had as a senior park service officer is we were having people trying to cheat the system, trying to find ways to come into the reservoir. Um, we have one checkpoint, one access point into the lake at Piru, so it made it a little easier for us than some of the bigger reservoirs like Nacimiento that has numerous launches and facilities that people can go on, including private uh, launch facilities. So I approached the board and management and asked for and inclusion in our ordinances that allow the park service officers to issue citations for people failing to go through the inspection program. And that was another step we took to try to increase uh, activity to prevent people and deter them. Um, that was really the gist of our prevention program leading up to the 2013 arrival was, our program was linchpinned on clean, drain, and dry. Every boat coming in, whether it had ice water melted in the back, oil, any moisture, aquatic plant life, fish scale, sand, debris that could have come from a reservoir constituted a fail and that boat would fail. When we first started in 2008, approximately 50% of all boats coming into the reservoir failed the inspection process. Um, I can tell you myself personally, I've probably inspected four to 5,000 boats in the last few years. I've been kicked, spit on, had my life threatened, all for the fact of 
coming in. It's a very serious issue for boaters. They, they, don't, they don't want to listen. They want on the water and they want on at all costs. Um, but, you know, I've seen all the tricks and the biggest concern for us was moisture. They came in wet, they lowered their outdrive anywhere with water, a tablespoon or two gallons, it didn't matter, they failed. And that was really the main focus of our program. The difference between our program and other programs that didn't evolve in our program was many programs as at the evolution of the uh, issue occurred in Piru and, and in the region was many people implemented a quarantine period even if you passed inspection. Um, Kachuma, Casita, some of the other lakes in the area said if you pass inspection you still have to be quarantined for a period of time because we want to be sure that you passed. Our program, if you passed inspection, you were allowed on the water that day. The only time you were quarantined was if you failed the inspection. That's really it for our prevention measures. Two questions. Why would you let someone, you said you should, if somebody passed inspection, you would uh, issue a tag, and when they came back and if the tag and the, trail, the boat the trailer still were the same, you'd let them on the lake without an inspection. But in the meantime, they could have gone to a lake that was contaminated. How would you know without, it seems to me like you would have to conduct an inspection every single time somebody came to the lake. Well, they can't launch their boat off of the trailer if the tag is intact. So we inspect the tag and then do a visual cursory search on the outside of the boat to make sure there's no adult muscles that attach to it and then to see if the tag had been tampered with. The tag was a uh, stainless steel galvanized or like a galvanized type tag with a lead seal that we crimped and it crimped the cable intact and it would prevent the boat from being removed. Oh, off I the see. Trailer. So Unless they could the not have, they could not right. have put it into another right. body of water. Second question, why, why the delay in the quarantine? I mean, Casitas did in, institute a quarantine and thus far has had no known in, in vase, invasion of quagga mussels. Well, for me, from my perspective, the one challenge that I have is you're trying to find the balance to be able to provide a recreation service and still have a, an effective prevention program. And we felt that instituting an inspection or a quarantine program similar to what Kachuma and Casitas did, that hindered our ability to be able to provide a recreation facility that was viable. Um, but is there, recreation really on the same level as irrigation and drinking water? I wouldn't think so. It's essentially- a There was policy issues that went with that too from our board, so I, I can't speak to all those because I wasn't involved in all the discussions, but I can tell you from the recreation aspect, that was my concern, was trying to find that balance and being able to provide recreation to the public. Um, but yes, I, I see what you're saying, yes. But there was policy decisions that were made uh, with other things being considered. I think if, if I could add, not not to um, say it in a defensive mode at all, but there was also some discussion that uh, Piru was positioned directly below Pyramid Lake. So there was some discussion of perhaps um, not exceeding the restrictions that were being placed on a lake above us, not being necessarily, it, how effective it would be to be more, more strict at Piru than, than the procedures were at here. There, there, there were some concerns early on with the implementation of the program and not implementing a quarantine program because the thinking behind that was if we implemented a program and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and pyramid above, above us who was at the time not doing anything at all, we could do all this for nothing and then still end up with a coagula muscle. So that was in the initial discussions. As that evolved, you know, other policies came into play, other discussions came into play. Oh. Uh. Um, so, back to the jet ski <laughs> issue. And so, is, are there risks? Well, just back to the jet ski issue that, that you guys recently approved, are there risks 
I mean, could a jet ski, do they have bilges or do they have water? Do you feel 100% confident in the uh, decontamination? I don't, uh, me personally, as a person who's inspected a lot of boats, I don't feel that there's any more risk with a jet ski than there is a kayak, a canoe, a boat. I mean, they're all a vector. They all can transport them. Um, I will share with you that since the end of May, we haven't even really launched boats. We don't have a boat launch at this point. We're out of water. Since the jet ski program went into play, we've done just below 50 jet ski launches in total. Um, what we're doing is our concession service has a person standing at the launch ramp round the clock seven days a week if there's jet skis on the lake. And when the boat comes off the water, they're having them start the motor, flush it out, and then on their way out, we're recommending to them to clean, drain, and dry, five day minimum, giving them the whole speech and the spiel. Um, a vast majority of our boaters um, are repeat customers at this point, and because we don't have the large ski boats, um, it's just not, there's really no boating, unfortunately. Okay, one more question. So you're talking about that you guys didn't quarantine. So if you knew that they say they were on an infested lake, but that they passed, you still let them on? If they said they were on an infested body yeah. of water, they were quarantined. Okay. Yeah. Because we have that quarantine. And I think like people getting inspected and failing and them getting mad that they're not on the lake is because they're uneducated on what they can do to our lakes. So as our county, we've been trying to do more outreach programs, especially for NASI. You're saying NASI, but they have about 44 ramps around the lake, private, most private. But um, we've been doing a program like a, um, what is it, the vessel program, the residential vessel program, where we, to be able to go into the program, we have they have to watch the video and we train them all. So we've been having a lot of training courses where we're trying to let the community um, educate the community on this issue that we're having. And we do press releases and stuff like that in our county so people know what's happening. So if they fail or, and we, we tell them you're gonna expect like a 45 minute delay of getting onto the lake for the clean drain and dry. So maybe more education in counties, maybe people wouldn't be as mad. One and of the then, efforts that we tried um, initially early on that I was a big proponent of was a, uh, a regional program to get everybody in the area on the same page, yeah. uh, an inspection and uh, prevention program. Unfortunately, various agencies have different mindsets and different takes on how that program should look, so it was very difficult even to get people in the same room. Uh, through the help of Eloise, we were able to get uh, the Quagra Consortium set up, and we had a, for a short period of time, a reciprocal program with Castaic and Pyramid where we were following the same standards and protocols on our inspection programs, but obviously that ended when we turned up with water muscles. So um, I would agree that you know education and uh, kind well, of a, um, a regional approach to it is best. Yeah, I mean, we're paired up with Monterey, luckily, and they're 100% on board, and their parks and rangers are the ones that actually take care of the lake. So they're a big help to us to tell us like, oh, people have been off the lake and we can go and call the ramps and say, hey, people didn't go on with muscle inspection forms and stuff like that, which is pretty nice. And um, I just feel like I understand that you guys had like, if they pass, they went on for recreational use. But to my understanding, if your body's infested, people aren't gonna wanna come do recreation anymore anyways. So then if they're denied, then you can still have so, recreation. So right now, are, we're continuing with pre-inspections of boats coming into the reservoir. That is centered on the thinking and the process that we don't want additional invasive species and we don't want to introduce more quagga mussels into the reservoir when we're trying major efforts and spending a lot of money to kind of control and reduce the population. So if you're allowing boats just to come in freely, so we're still doing pre-inspections on boats coming in and you'll see it later on in the presentation. I'm we sorry. plan on implementing exit inspections on all vessels leaving the reservoir. Right now we don't have a formal exit inspection of boats, um, but we are talking to boaters. We're asking them to do things like remove their float. But in the very near future, we will be implementing an exit inspection program that they will sign an affidavit for saying that if they want to launch on Piru, that they'll go through that and that their boat will be entered into the QID database. And we appreciate that too. And we right now, <laughs> one of the things we're trying to do for prevention to help our partners in the area is 
we keep track of all the boats in our own personal Excel database, and we've been providing that, I know, to like the county centers of Bisbo on, uh, I believe it was a weekly basis. So that information is available if, if people want that. Okay.